Welcome to Political Buzz. I'm Phil Arno. Politics as usual. Well, maybe not this time. In the race for mayor of Buffalo, there has been a significant wrench thrown into the mix. India Walton, a woman of color who describes herself as a socialist, managed to surprisingly win the Democratic nomination. Byron Brown, the long-term incumbent, is now faced with a write-in candidacy, an unprecedented challenge. And just to make matters a little bit more interesting, there's two more write-in candidates running in the race, Ben Carlisle, who was on this show last week, and Jazz Miles, who's appearing with me today. How the people of Buffalo will react to this mix is anyone's guess, but one thing is certain, a lot is riding on their decision. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Jazz Miles. And I want to first ask, who is Jazz Miles? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, born and raised in Buffalo. Um, lived in the area my whole life. So I've seen the best and the worst of what the city has to offer, right? In the, from growing up to now and how it has changed. And uh, as a person who's produced a lot of sports programs, spent a lot of hours producing television with wrestling and helping kids and other organizations, I see where there is a lack of leadership and the things that could be done better in the city. So I'm hoping to bring some of my past experience in life and the encounters I've had to the forefront to help do better for Buffalo. Okay. Well, you know, we've, there's been four candidates now for this office, mayor of Buffalo. Um, I saw you on the, the one televised debate and it was, it's tough when you're trying to be a write-in candidate. India Walton is the uh, nominee of the Democrat Party. Sure, sure. Mayor Brown is the incumbent. Mm -hmm. I had uh, Ben Carlisle on a show previously. Right. And I talked to him about the challenge of being neither the party candidate or an incumbent. That's a challenge because you're a write-in candidate. And it's the same thing with you. You're, you're not the party candidate and you're not an incumbent. Uh, comparatively, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. Uh, how do you approach a position like that when you're trying to run for an office and you're relatively handicapped by that lack of advantage that the other two are enjoying? So first, I have to say, life is a challenge. So anything that I've done in life, I never just took it as, okay, I'm gonna do it and it's gonna happen like this. So when I started the sports show, I'm going up against Empire Sports. Channel 7, you know, Ed Kilgore, really great people. Mm -hmm really great people, you know what I mean? I'm going up against them to start a sports show that wound up having Joe Montana, Pete Rose, Bill Clinton on my show for sports. Same thing with wrestling. So wrestling was a little bit different, you're competing a little bit differently, but everything's a challenge. So even being on this program now, getting the name out there and having the name recognition I have from in the past, just even doing tailor-made foods and that kind of thing, some of that recognition is going to help with that challenge. Some of the other part of it comes into the money. So they raise 800,000 here, 200,000 there between the two of them. And they're able to get more people out with their t-shirts on and more signs out, more radio ads. But if they're not doing anything, then it's the same fluff. So part of that challenge is taken care of by people now realizing that the fluff they get from the Democratic Party isn't really helping them. And that's another part of taking care of the challenge. Okay, when you, you go out and talk to people and tell them that you're running for mayor, um, what kind of feedback are you getting? What kind of response? Uh, so most of it has been positive. Let's say three and a half or four out of five have been positive. Some people say, well, you don't have a shot. And they mentioned the money mm -hmm. and the name notoriety and backed by the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But the majority of people that know me, that have come to my business for food and know me doing a sports show and how I raise my kids, they're like, oh, Jazz, oh, thank you. I'm glad you're doing this. And oh, man, you? Yeah, if anybody can do it, you're the kind of person that could get it done. Because they know the personal attitude and what I bring to what I'm doing. And so the motivation you know, let's face it, a lot of people would not take this challenge. Right. A lot of people would think that the odds are just too much and uh, it's, it's a daunting uh, effort that you have to put into it. It's going to take a lot of your life mm -hmm. to, to go after this in this, in this time period. Uh, what is it that motivates you to do this? To restore the republic, our forefathers. The one thing the Democrat Party can never say, and this is why they want to change history. See, black men and white men started the Republican Party. The Democrat Party can never say that, so they want to rewrite history. You know what I mean? So the challenge has already been done by our forefathers. The challenge now is to stop socialism, Democrat or otherwise. I mean, a slap in the face is a slap in the face. Forehand or backhand, you still got slapped. 
So you could soften it by putting democratic socialists in front of it, but it's still socialism. So the challenge is to maintain what we already had that our forefathers hadn't fought for, that my family and relatives hadn't fought for, and bring that to the forefront in a better way to move everyone forward, not just special groups, select interests, and that kind of thing, or special interests and select groups. The mayor has to be fair beyond compare. And if the mayor can't be fair beyond compare, they should get out of there or shouldn't be there to begin with. Okay, well, I'm gonna follow up on that. You talk about uh, the founding of the, of the party and our forefathers and where we used to be. Tell me what you would want to restore? Where do you want to go back to that we well, don't life, have life, liberty, now? and pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. They seem clueless on how to do this. It's a very basic principle. So at the yep. debate, I was told by someone, India Walton, that I should read a book. Well, I have. I've read plenty of books. My parents paid for a great education for me. My first library card was for the Schneider Library out in Eggersville mm -hmm. when I was four or five years old. Okay, so I was on LeBron and Stonecroft and streets and in the city mm -hmm. at the same time. All right, so if you're clueless on how to do this, check this out, all right? It explains to you how to do it. And you just bring back what we used to have. So in the 60s, before the great society, 40% of black families owned their own businesses. Now, they didn't own Ford plants and they didn't own warehouses, but they owned the corner stores, the laundromats, or the dry cleaners, the tailor shops, the barber shops in our community, the food restaurants. So you had a different community feel in that area when I was growing up. That all changed. So now you have less than 8%, 7% or so of black people owning their own business. And this isn't a black or white issue, it's just the way it's gone about. You start something you call the great society, and then part of that is having it where you're, if you hire a minority, you get federal tax benefits. So now if you hire a black woman, you're getting two basic tax benefits, so now you're not gonna hire a black man back in the 60s, early 70s. And it's something that got created that moved all the way through, and for us to be a blue state, a blue wall, as Andrew Cuomo said. A Republican can never win in New York State. Well, then a lot of this lies at their feet because if we've had a Democrat mayor since the 60s, if the state assembly's been Democrat majority since the 70s, well, where's the great? The same people that try to explain to us how great our life isn't and they want to blame a color or they want to blame a Republican party, which later I'll refer to as Fred and Ethel in our Lucy analogy, okay, they want to blame everyone else, but you've been in charge. You write the laws, the legislation, you run the common council. So what's going on and where's the great? 16 years of all things brown and getting the brown end of the stick, where's the great? You know, the, uh, the message has been pretty consistently that we have to improve things, we have to uh, end racism. So we get back to, to the improvement? Yep. Home ownership. Mm -hmm. Property ownership, business ownership. Safe streets, maintain the criminal element, and if you're gonna get involved in education, make sure it's the best education a child could possibly get on earth. Don't claim we're the greatest country and not actually show it. Don't bring people to something, they're bringing immigrants in from everywhere. So if we're not so great as the Democrats and some of them would like for you to believe, well, why are you bringing people in? It can't be both. So if we get some ownership taken care of, if we get some business ownership taken care of, and then we can educate our children from the inside out better. The majority of my family, I just wanna tell you, I was raised great. So here's what I'll say to you. The Miles family. Now Roosevelt Miles passed away before I was born, but I was born with the last name Miles. Not one person of his family ever treated me like I wasn't theirs. Every person in the Miles family treated me like I was their child. I'm a Fleming by birth. So that's Cleveland Fleming, Ron Fleming, the great Ron Fleming who had fine print news, my Uncle Cleve, a veteran of the Korean War. So my father's brother owned a car wash on Bailey and Lang for 40, 50 years almost. So people in my family, my father, Dell Taylor, produced a guitar player, myself a piano player, raised around great. The Fleming family, the Miles, okay, and Hezekiah Johnson who actually raised me. All great people. We have to bring great back into everyday life of little children. When I walked into my Ron's, Uncle Ron's house as a child, I never knew who I was gonna see. And I mean like Marvin, like Marvin Gaye, Gladys Knight and the Pips, I never knew. You talk about Jeff Nixon, I would see him, Reggie McKenzie, O.J. Simpson, Joe Ferguson at my Uncle Ron's house. Never knew who you were gonna walk in and see. Same thing with my Uncle L.J.'s hand car wash. We were doing stuff with Harvey Corky and Tice back in the TV, you know, radio production days. So raise your children with and around great. Have people in your family that can show them the productivity of owning a business, having an education and how to apply it from a personal level. Well, I think part of what you're saying, if, if I oh. can interpret that, is the, the great society did discourage families. It, 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 it wanted to substitute government as right. the They still the want to do it now. Yep. That's, oh my goodness, socialism would be nationalizing or federalizing everything. But you go back to the great society where it wasn't that great, 
if you go to Nam, Vietnam, you fight for your country, you come back and you can't go to your house now because she's on food stamps or the welfare system. So now the father can't go back home. Right. Plus, he's not going to get the job now because they're going to hire the woman, the double minority thing we talked about before. Right. So it's been an entire concept of putting down or degrading a certain group of people in their first mindset, but it also trickled down to other races. Yeah, the, the old saying, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. It could be the best of intentions, but if you're, if you're actually in, encouraging someone to not have a family structure right. because you're giving them incentive to do better without a family. Exactly. That, and that's, that's human nature. I mean, you're going to go with what's, you know, what's easiest. What works best for you. And it's such a, they want people focused on the money and financial aspect of things that people are willing to sell out what's really important. You know, so if I came back from Vietnam and I had Agent Orange inside of me, and let's say in the 72, I had a child. So by the time Joe Biden was in front of the Senate calling us predators, my child would have been 18, 17, 18 years old. So the child that he's talking about is a product of a man who fought in a war for his country that comes back with chemicals in him that get passed on to children. Now, if the child isn't able to be with his father, or this child thinks, well, he prefers his other kids more than me, he might rebel or act up in a way that's really not his fault. That now people are going to say, well, it's all society's fault. Well, no, you're the society, you're government. You wrote this. So if I owned a business in the 60s, a food store, and they implemented food stamps, now I'm used to everybody coming in with cash. So I just spent $2,000 stocking my store. Now some people came in and they just spent $1,000 in food stamps. Well, that doesn't benefit me right now, so how do I restock my store for the Thursday, Friday, Saturday payday guys that's about to come in and feed their families? Because they used to come here every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, getting food for their family, paying for it out of their GM check, their Republic, you know, um, Republic Steel check. You know what I mean? Yep. Now, where did that go? Well, I, I'm seeing your, your philosophy, and I, it, what I'm taking away is you have a firm belief in individuals and individuals' rights. Absolutely. And, and responsibilities on top of that. Right. Um, and we're going to continue this conversation, and we're going to get more specifically into the race for mayor right. when we come back. We're out of time for this segment, but... This is going to lead into a very interesting conversation specifically about the mayor of Buffalo race. Uh, stay tuned, and we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the conversation. My guest is Jazz Miles, who is running for mayor of Buffalo as a write-in candidate. Yes, I want everyone to use your pen to write Jazz Miles in, and let's go miles together, Buffalo. Very good. Mm -hmm. The last 15 years or so, Byron Brown has been mayor. The crime rate has gone down. There was a study from PolitiFact saying up until the pandemic, there was a, a reduction of crime, and it spiked a little bit during the pandemic. Right. Um, okay. I'm not sure so now, specific categories. Did they release people from prison for the pandemic? Yes, they did. Mm. Do they have bail reform and catch a release? Yes, they do. So you can tell me the numbers are down, but now, let me tell you a number that is and, up. And, and that's, that was state related too, because mm -hmm. they did pass the bail reform uh, bill on a state level. Okay. So that right. And bit. they also have uh, the SAFE Act. So New York State has the oh, yes. toughest gun laws in the nation, but yet there's still gun crimes. Yeah, we know All that right. that's going to increase. So their buyback <laughs> program doesn't work, much like cash for clunkers and shovel ready jobs. They have all these catchy names. Um, sure, the medical corridor is great. In the next 20 to 40 years, Buffalo should churn out some of the best doctors and medical experts in the world due to what's going on in some of these areas. A lot of that started with UB being right on Bailey and, uh, Bailey and Maine some 40, 50 years ago where our development into the medical part became prominent in this area. I used to be around Dr. Philip Wells most of my young life. He was a chief surgeon for Miller Fillmore. So I have a little bit of background in different areas in this regard. Um, but where is it for everyone? So you can develop a medical corridor, and that's great. But you still have dilapidated homes, and you're bringing in more people to live in the city. It's a sanctuary city. We're going to have more crime. We have homeless problems. Um, let's put it like this. $800 million was given to Bill de Blasio's wife to run a Thrive program to help mentally challenge people that are out on the street. Where's that $800 million? Like, that's a lot of money. Solyndra was got a guaranteed loan of $530 million. Solyndra was in Buffalo also. Where is that money? What happened to any of this? So you could throw money, numbers, policy, 
all of that stuff that where's the actual results? You know what I mean? We're dealing with a party, it's a situation of two different Lucys. So you have one Lucy from the Ricardo family who's always having to get involved in your life and your antics. What you're doing on your own is not good enough for this Lucy, has to be involved. And it costs money. And they come up with plans and schemes to be involved. And then when Lucy gets caught and she can't explain it, she blames Fred and Ethel, in this case, the Republican Party. They want to blame the Republican Party now because they can't pass, pass this 3.5 or 6 trillion, as Bernie Sanders wants, type deal. And they want to blame you, the media, for not getting it over to the people on why we need this. It's $25 million going to butterflies, that kind of thing. They're, they're penalizing you for being married. They're putting penalties on small businesses in this, in this legislature. It's 11% to the people or to infrastructure, 89% to the Green New Deal, because Miss All Out Crazy herself, AOC, said the world's going to end in 12 years. But yet, it's going to attack the rich party. The Obamas bought a house on Martha's Vineyard after she stated that. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of, they're their own quicksand. And if this was the world of Marvel, the Democratic Party would be juggernaut. And in my personal opinion, the only way to stop juggernaut is to drop him in quicksand. Because any way he goes, that's the way he's going. And that is their policies, is their own quicksand to their mentality of what they want to do is one thing and how you're going to live your life is another. Well, that's, you know, those are all overall concepts. <clears throat> and that's the big picture. Mm -hmm. um, on, on our local level, what can be done? They're party over principle. You can see how they handled the Andrew Cuomo situation. So locally, once again, it goes back to employment and less crime, mm -hmm. better education, more confident in yourself as a child being, you know, growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, it all starts with that structure on this level at this moment. Right now, they're trying to take our kids away from us and use the pandemic and schooling and education. And stop it. You, don't, you want to defund the police. So why are you going to get the Justice Department or the IRS or anybody else to attack parents as their terrorist? Because for years, when the parents weren't involved, you want to paint them as deadbeats or derelicts. Mm -hmm. Now they're involved, and now they're terrorists. From the same party that took prayer out of school, they took the Pledge of Allegiance out of school, they took discipline out of the home, Okay, and that's the party that I'm going to let tell me how to raise my child. It doesn't make sense. Would it, would a mayor be able to have any influence over the school system in well, the city? Well, no. See, the mayor, as the mayor, I would just advocate for you to put your child in the best educational system. That's for you. And the unfortunate part is that they keep people so broke. We're paying an extra $175 a month right now for goods that weren't that high during the pandemic. $175 a month. That's virtually sending your child to school. You could send your child to a St. Aloysius or other schools for about the same amount of money that you're paying more now due to inflation, due to an incompetence. Well, it goes beyond that. In the 1950s... But it's a billion dollars going it, to the education system. Well, it, the, in the 1950s, the average taxpayer paid about 3% of their income to the federal government in right. taxes. Right. And it was similar in, in other taxes. Now, I've done a study, and I did a story on this, the average taxpayer between federal, state, and local taxes pays over 50% of right. their income in taxes. And that doesn't include fees that are not called taxes. Right. You know, they're, they're like hidden things. Right. Like, right. you know, if you look at your, your, your phone bill, mm -hmm. those utility taxes, those, those, those two or three hidden dollars taxes, or 12, yep. mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the inheritance taxes, the, thing, the other things that are kind of subtle that are not just direct payroll taxes or right. things that we normally think of. So and by the time you're done, you need two income earners in every family as opposed to one like when we were growing up. Right. Uh, you just can't get by. And all of this was a structural plan by them. They've been planning this socialism route for the last 30, I mean, the last 100 years. And they're winning. To I get mean, into this they're winning. It's, there's no, you know, so I no want to run something it. by you, though, as far as defund the police go. So I want to run this by anyone who wants to defund the police. All right, so average officer, step one, step two, $800 a week, okay? So 36 grand a year to $40,000 a year as an officer. So for $800, I'm going to give you $800 if you chase this un unknown young man a half a mile. I will give you $800 right now to chase this unknown young man a half a mile over 10 fences, crawl space, a couple of dogs, okay? Now are you going to do that? Okay, so now what if he has your wallet? What are you going to do? I'm going to chase him. <laughs> okay, now if you don't catch him, you're probably going to call the police or just let it go? Uh, well, he has your it's, wallet. It's, yeah, I'm going to not let him go. But, okay, you know. so ask anyone who wants to defund the police, who are you going to call if you have to chase somebody a half a mile through 20 backyards? Because that's what they do. Well, I'm, I'm not going to call a social worker. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> but looking at what they do, 
okay? For the amount of money that they get paid. And that's a one-time example if you're gonna do it. They might have to do that two or three times a week. Well, that, that brings up a lot of, there's a lot of directions you can go on this conversation. I, I once uh, talked to a police officer when I was in Los Angeles and, and we were doing a, a story on, on gang mm -hmm. violence and it was, it was such a horrendous problem at the time and young people being shot and lives being lost. And I asked the police officer, this was off the record, I said, you know, what's the solution here? How can this be reversed? And he looked at me and shook his head and said, look, you know, when I stop a kid, 13, 14 years old on the street, and I tell him, this is not the life for you, this is not the way to go, and he pulls out a wad of cash mm -hmm. from his pocket that's more than I earn in a month, <laughs> How am I going to justify to him that he's on the wrong path? Right. It's just impossible. The drug money out there and the things that they have going for them, I can't fight it as a police officer. And even now, let's speak about California. So in San Francisco, a few Walgreens are about to close because they get robbed so much because the Democrats have it set up that you can steal up to $950. Right. Okay. So now they think that's cool. You cool with that? Because they think that's cool. So now what have we applied it to when the stores run out of merchandise, now they're coming to your house. So if you're cool with socialism and thinking it's okay to steal less than just up to $950 worth of goods, when the store runs out, they're coming to your house. So what $950 of goods are you gonna let them take out of your home? See, so apply it like that with socialism. You know what I mean? It just wouldn't make sense if you're saying, well, these people are entitled to these goods. Because if that's the case, I've worked in television for a lot of years, and I should be doing your job, let's say. So socialism would dictate to me to tell you to get out of that chair, man. You owe me that job. I've been robbed and held down all my life. Well, let's, let's go back and try and get centered on, on the race again. Right. The, the, the mayoral race. We have Byron Brown running for re-election. We have 16 uh, years. Yep. We have uh, Walton, who is a self-described socialist, mm -hmm. and now you know she has an advantage because she's got that that party endorsement. Well, also the disadvantage of the socialist part. A lot of people are not feeling the socialism part. If you talk to the people out at Mercy Hospital that are striking right now, they're not feeling, you know, like there's so many other more important things in life happening right now than labels and tags. So for someone to come in and say, well, we just went through the worst pandemic ever, Okay, the worst pandemic ever, but we're about to raise your taxes. And we can't really even tell you why what we're gonna use it for, but you're gonna have less policing mm -hmm. along with it. It just doesn't make sense. He's been in charge for 16 years. Buffalo's been on the top 10 most dangerous cities in America list multiple times. When he came in, we were the second poorest city. On his way out now, we're the third poorest city. Where's the great? Where's the growth? Well, you, this has been an interesting conversation. Jazz Miles has certainly got a lot to say. He's very knowledgeable. And I love having people like this on my show as a guest. And anytime you like, sir, it, anytime you like. It, it, it's, after this race, no matter what happens, I want to have you back because this Not is a, a great problem, conversation. We haven't even talked about the border. We haven't talked about inflation, the economy, the gas. I mean, there's so many things yeah. that they're just messing That's up it. on. And In nine months. Yep. Let's go, Brandon. <laughs> Let's go. Go, I, 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 I appreciate you being here. Oh, and, I thank you, sir. Uh, you know, thank this, you. Is, this is a terrific conversation. Uh, I don't know what kind of a mayor you would be, but you're a great oh. conversationalist, and, and I, I welcome you. Until next time, this is Jazz Miles <laughs> asking you to use your pen to write Jazz Miles in. Thank you so much for watching Political Buzz, and it's been a great, interesting conversation. Thank you for watching WBBZ TV. We really appreciate it. We're your only local TV station. We'll see you next time on Political Buzz. Stand up and go vote. 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 Because when they take away your vote, they take away your hope. Stand up. Take away your vote, they take away your hope. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, and go vote. Cause when they take away your vote, they take away your hope. Stand up.